Hi, everyone. How many of you are perfectionists? I know, I think I can be at times. I do some work, I weed the garden, I hedge the bushes, or clean windows, or prepare a sermon, and I look back at it, and if it's not, if there's streaks on the windows, or weeds I missed, or section I missed, I need to go over and make it perfect. <laughs> so perfectionists can be hard to live with sometimes, because they're not only tough on themselves, but they can also be tough on others. So be careful about that. So how about you? Are you a perfectionist? Or are you more the kind of person who uh, says, hey, that'll do, or that's good enough, let's move on? Is God going to accept that'll do in his kingdom? Is he going to accept that's good enough? Or is God looking for perfection? And if he is, how on earth is he going to make a bunch of imperfect people perfect? So be thinking about that. And I know I had a, we all try to be perfect, but... I had a neighbor, for example, who back in Washington state that had some brown spots or brown brown grass areas of his lawn that didn't look all that good. And he was having some people come over and visit him. And those people visiting always had a perfect lawn. So anyway, I was walking by his house and he was spray painting the brown grass with green spray paint. And it really looked good after, <laughs> after he was done. And I asked him what was going on, and he explained to me, well, was that now a perfect lawn? It looked perfect on the outside, but when you start to examine it closely, it really wasn't. So we can look perfect, but be like Jesus said, you know, whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones inside. So let's look at a verse in the Bible, uh, Matthew 5, verse 48. And this is a misunderstood verse a lot of times. It says that you shall be, therefore you shall be perfect, as just as your Father in heaven is perfect. In context, that was after him saying that we need to uh, uh, love, our na- love our enemies, do good to those who hate us, bless those who curse us, because that's what Father does. And therefore you shall be perfect, just like your Father is perfect in heaven, just as he is. Now, the vast majority of the Bible translations do translate that verse exactly that way. Be be perfect. You shall be perfect. We're called to perfection, as perfect as our Heavenly Father, in fact. How on earth is that ever going to be possible? That's what I want to talk about today. One version out of many, many says you shall be complete, but the vast majority says you shall be perfect. But is perfection even reasonably, remotely possible? If so, how? How? And can that word perfect mean other things in the Greek? Uh, Frankly, you know, when I look at that verse and I look at myself, frankly, I feel like a miserable failure, miserable failure a lot of times. I really do. Kind of feel like Jacob when he was presenting himself to Pharaoh in Egypt. And Pharaoh had asked him in Genesis 47, verse 9, 8 and 9, how old are you? And he said, well... The days of the years of my pilgrimage on this earth are 130 years. Few and evil have been the years of the days of the years of my life. The way he saw himself looking back at his life was, boy, how disappointing. <laughs> you know, there's certainly no self-righteousness in that comment. Do you relate to that? You know what? I sure can. We'll be coming perfect, in fact, as perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. I want to ask you, will that take an act of God? So hello, everyone. This is Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock, where Yeshua is both the rock and the light to the Father's glory. We Be sure to tell others about our website, because we have no money to advertise it much. We do a little bit, but very little. So please, all of you, uh, if you like what you're hearing here and you're gaining information and inspiration, please spread the word to others as well. This topic is important, and the reason we need it, I believe if you fully understand today's sermon and internalize it completely, understanding this can change your life going forward forever. You'll have a lot more joy, a lot more peace. It's directly tied into the teaching that God imbues, imputes, credits us with his righteousness, as especially in the book of 
Romans and others, Colossians and Philippians and Galatians. Even Hebrews talks about the righteousness which is by faith. And 2 Corinthians 5.21, that Christ became sin for us. He took our sin, guilt, and penalties that we might become the righteousness of God. His very own righteousness in him. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But you, if you want other verses on that, Romans 3, 21, Romans 4, verses 5 and 6, Romans 5, verses 17 to 20. So please check those out. Many of you do believe that you're seen already today by God as already being spiritually perfect. There is a verse that says he has perfected forever. Those who are being called and so on. So you, I'll, I'll read that. But what does that mean? And we'll talk about all that. But if you believe that, that you're already seen right now as perfect in God's eyes, why do so many of those same people act like they don't have God's perfect righteousness? And they feel guilty and they feel shameful of their own conduct and so forth. And they feel like they're missing the mark. That's why I said if we really understand this, though we fall short, we will be encouraged. Is this perfection the Bible speaks of something we progress gradually toward as we build holy, righteous character and we resist sin until finally God says, you know what, you've come along far enough and I'm, it's good enough or even you're perfect, flawless enough or is this perfection accomplished some other way than just us striving for perfection, striving for godly character? We do have to obey God. We do have to stop the way of sin. We do have to turn from our old ways. Don't get me wrong. But how and when does God see us perfect? I have a friend back in Southern California. He believes that this verse is saying that if we don't compile a perfect track record of perfect righteous living for quite a long time up to the point where Christ returns, I mean years of daily perfection, we will not be in the kingdom of God. I tried to explain to him the credited righteousness and all of that, but he rejects it. He claims he's getting there to that perfection. He claims that with the Holy Spirit, we should be able to do exactly what Jesus did. My friend said Jesus proved that a physical human being can be perfect. So I asked him if he could name me a single person he knows other than Christ who attained that perfection in this life. He had already told me he's not quite there yet. And without hesitation, he said, my dad. Well, I knew his dad. Indeed, his dad was a very nice person, godly person. But I suggested that if his dad could hear what he was saying, right? his dad has since died, but if his dad could hear what he was saying, he'd be appalled. He would do the proverbial rolling over in his grave. I said, I know your dad would not accept that, though he might look perfect to us looking on. It's more like the spraying of the green paint on the brown parts of the grass. Because we don't know his thoughts. We don't know his ups and downs. We don't know what battles he would be fighting. So what's the answer? Let's dive in. We'll cover that, uh, that we do, in fact, become perfect. But when? What is that perfection? Who does it? When and how does it happen? We'll cover all that. So bear with me here. First of all, if we look at the English word perfect, I know the Bible was... The New Testament was written in Greek, at least most of it. Some think parts of it were in Hebrew. But whatever, you know, the word perfect, what does it mean to be perfect in the Greek and in the English? Well, in the English, if we look at the word perfection or perfect, it means no flaw, flawless. Nothing can be seen in it that would make it less than perfect. You can't get it any better. It's perfect. The dictionary, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, says perfect primarily means, quote, being entirely without fault or defect. Flawless, as in a perfect diamond. Other definitions from Webster's says perfect can also mean, and I think this gives us a hint where this could be going, faithfully reproducing the original, as in letter perfect. They also say lacking in no essential detail, as in complete. So we'll come back to those in a minute or two. So going to the English dictionary definition, I think we're in trouble. None of us is flawless. 
all the time. Maybe we might be for a few minutes. <laughs> Matthew 5:48 says, you shall be perfect. But what did the original Greek mean? Just in a rough overview right now, it has the meaning of reaching an end goal, being completed, being mature, being complete, finished, finished. Get that word there. Complete, reaching an end goal, and finished. So, in the Greek, it doesn't mean necessarily flawless. Certainly when we think of God, he is flawless. We think of humans, no, we are not flawless. Here's some key points, key, key agreements I want to start off with first. Start up with first. I'm having a hard time speaking today for some reason. Can we all agree, point number one, right now, you are not, I am not flawless. We are not flawlessly perfect in our present daily lives, our behavior, our conduct, our Christianity. I know there are verses that seem to say we have already right now, been perfected. We'll read those soon. But please understand that all mankind in the past, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and all have earned, therefore, the wages of sin. We were all infected with sin at birth through Adam and Eve and the family line. We were all infected with sin, except one. Yeshua, Jesus Christ, was not born infected with sin. Because he was uh, his father's seed, perfect father's seed, had impregnated Mary, the Holy Spirit. And so Yeshua was not infected with the sin of mankind. That is really important to understand. Someday I'll give a whole sermon on what that means. God's, God gave us a remedy, though, because we were, all humans have this terminal condition called sin. We're infected with sin. And we will die. But God gave us a perfect remedy that delivers us from the punishment and gives us not just the punishment removed and the guilt removed, but also gives us the power to be leaving the way of sin and live in God's righteousness, which we must do. More on that later. But in this life, we still fail, even with God's Spirit. As Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I still sometimes do, he says in Romans 7. So, are we already perfected? In Philippians 3.14, Paul makes it very clear that he didn't think he was already, that he'd already attained perfection. Philippians 3.14, and uh, this is after talking about wanting the righteousness of God by faith and to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul says this, Philippians 3.14. I'll read from the English Standard Version for this one. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Not that I'm already perfect. This is late in his life, writing to the Philippians. I believe he's in jail at this point, probably in Rome. So right now we're not already perfect. Paul says so. I don't think you and I are better than Paul. But there is a time coming. When we will be truly perfect. So hang on. But in the meantime, as flesh and blood beings, sin still too easily ensnares us. So Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Lay aside every weight that, and the sin that so easily ensnares us. That doesn't sound like perfect people yet. And run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. That's from the Holman Bible. The author and finisher of our faith, says New King James, I believe. Again, our eyes are on Jesus, not on ourselves. Not on ourselves and what we're doing. Our eyes are on Jesus, very important. So point number one, no one is flawlessly, spiritually perfect all the time right now. While we're flesh and blood, on our own performance, even with God's spirit. I don't know. If you could attain perfection in thoughts, attitudes, deeds, and service for several days or weeks or months or years in a row, I just don't think you can in this physical life. So I disagree with my friend in California. Point number two. Okay, point number one is we're all flawed. We're all, we're not perfect. Point, so I guess I got to admit, I'm not perfect. Point number two to a second point 
Can we all agree that God and his son, though, are flawless and perfect in every single way? The Bible makes that very, very clear. I mean, David, many times in the Psalms, talks about his way is perfect, your law is perfect, and so on. God's way is perfect. Um, I, I, I love the fact that Satan's world, when they investigated, took a really close look at Christ just before the crucifixion. Pilate, the procurator, three times Pilate came out and told the Jews who wanted, the Jewish leaders who wanted to crucify Yeshua, Pilate said three times in John 18, 38, John 19, 4, and John 19, 6, I find no fault with this man. No fault. Three times. King David often talked about how perfect God's way was and how perfect God was. Um, and in Hebrews 4, verses 14 and 15, I'll put all these scriptures all printed out in the notes. I always suggest you hear the audio because I'll always say some things in audios that won't make it to the notes and vice versa. The notes will have all, all the scriptures and everything printed out because I want to move quickly. There's so much to cover. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 15 Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Okay, uh, verse 15. We don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, though, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he was perfect. But now hop back a couple chapters to Hebrews 2, verse 10. This is a strange-sounding verse in a way. If he's already perfect, was perfect. It was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, Hebrews 2.10, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation, to make the captain of their salvation, talking about Yeshua, Jesus, how? To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That's the how. It says even Christ was perfected by what he suffered. Wasn't he already perfect? Here's where the other meanings of perfect come in from the Greek. The Greek word for perfect, again, remember, can also mean completed, finished, to reach maturity, to reach the end goal. Yeshua, prior to his human life, ended in the crucifixion and his resurrection after that, into spirit, but his human life, had never before lived as a fully human being for years and years, had never before been born as a baby, dependent on Joseph and Mary, dependent on Mary's milk, dependent on Mary and Joseph protecting them, him. Prior to that, he had never, or had he ever experienced hunger? Had he ever been tempted to be overly angry or to lust after a woman? He, he was tempted and tried and tested in all points, including all those I just mentioned, yet without sin. Had he ever experienced torture? scourging, crucifixion, nails being pounded in his ankles and heels where the, the nerves are so painful down there. Total abandonment by practically all his friends except for one man, John, and all the rest of the men had run off. A few women stayed around at the cross. And his tribe, Judah, literally forsook him and abandoned him in, in, in the Greek form of the word Yehuda or Judah was Judas. I mean, he represented the, the tribe, the, the tribe of Judah, betrayed him, abandoned him. So everything he went through made him a better high priest. He understands abandonment. Have you been abandoned by your friends, by your family, by your daughter, by your son? Have you been abandoned? Have you gone through pain and suffering physically that goes on and on and on and on and on? That suffering perfected, Yeshua says in the Greek sense, of making him more complete, more finished, so that he can understand us better and be a better high priest. Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9. Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9. There it says that in the days of his flesh, when he'd suffered and he'd offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries to him who was able to save him from uh, death, he was heard because of his godly fear. 
he was hurt, but he still had to be, be beaten. He was, still had to be scourged. He still had to be crucified. And he still had to die. But though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So, yes, in spite of how painful it's going to be, I'm going to obey. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to betray my, my task that's been given me, he was saying. Verse 9, and having been perfected, Hebrews 5, 9, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We do have to obey him. Called by God to be high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So this in the Greek clearly, the word perfect here clearly points to a maturing, a becoming complete, a finishing going on, as we shall see. Hebrews 7, verse 28 Hebrews 7, verse 28. I have to clear something here first. Uh, For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected, finished, matured, completed. Not perfected in the sense that we think of it in the English, but in the Greek it can mean perfected, it can mean completed. Christ was made complete by the things which he suffered. He was perfected, finished, completed. As he never had gone through 30 years as a human before. You know what? You and I are also going through this same process to be better priests. Helping future people coming to God, especially in the millennium and beyond. So if they say, do you have any idea what it's like to have suffered physical pain, or to have had your daughter abandon you and not want anything to do with you? Do you have any idea what it's like to have lost a son? Do you have any idea what it's like to be alcoholic or to be homosexual or to whatever? And whatever problem. And we can say yes, because I was a sinner. I had some of those sins, and I had others you didn't mention. I had some that you you did mention we would say to them. So we are coming to maturity as well by the things we have to strive against and overcome, struggle, and go through and suffer for. I want to say this. Suffering is part of our calling to be perfected. Suffering, pain, trials are all part of the process of living and growing up in Christ. James says that in James 1 verses 2 to 4. James 1, verses 2 to 4, he says that, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete. It's lacking nothing. So James is making making it very clear here that it's through the suffering that we're all appointed to go through. We must go through it. Because it's through the hardships and the disappointments and the trials and the failures that we rise up again in the power of the Holy Spirit and defeat sin and defeat the temptation to quit. Pain, suffering, is part of the same process for us as it was for Yeshua. It's supposed to happen. Don't ever start thinking, why me? Why do I have to have my leg amputated from diabetes? Why do I have to? Whatever it is. Because suffering is supposed to happen. It's what perfects us, finishes us, completes us, matures us, makes us complete. Think of Job. Think of Paul. All the beatings and imprisonments, being left for dead after stoning. Think of Yeshua himself. Romans 8, verse 18, says our sufferings can't compare with the coming glory we're supposed to be going through, that we'll have someday. We're supposed to be going through all this. Knowing that should help us thank God for it. You know, I've got a little statue that says, be patient with me. God isn't done. God isn't finished with me yet. And it shows a partly chipped out, you can see the head of a man and his arm, but there's some chipping that still has to come out to make it a beautiful statue. I I get some inspiration weirdly out of that, and I'll put a picture in the notes here maybe. But look, Luke 9, 23, 
We're supposed to have a cross to carry. We're supposed to, in fact, bring it up, carry it every single day. Luke 9, 23, he said to them all, if any, if any of you desire to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So here the Greek word again. Let me say for, for perfect, perfect and so on. Telios. It's various words in the Greek. Uh, New Testament number 5046. Telios. Feminine telia. Means finished. That which has reached its end. It's term. It's end term. It's limit. Henceforth complete. Full. Wanting nothing. Now I'm about to read you a verse that you probably have never thought of in terms of the word perfect. It's the very same word that's being used. Is uh, a, a form of t- this one here is teleo, uh, very very similar, very close to teleos, to make an end, to accomplish, to complete something, not merely to end it, but to bring it to perfection or to its des- des- destined goal. It's what the word is that I'm about to read you. John nineteen thirty, Yeshua's last words. So when Yeshua had received the sour wine. He said, finished. It's complete. I've reached the goal. It's perfect. When he said finished, it's the same word being translated in many other places as perfect. Did you realize that before? So in a way on the cross there, he was saying, perfect. I've reached the end goal done it perfectly, and he gave up his spirit. Almost all translations here have it as finished. A couple say completed. No one translates it perfect, but it's teleo. It's the same word Paul said, I've finished the course. I've finished the course. I've completed the assignment. (laughs) He could also have said, same Greek word. So when Yeshua was about to die on the cross, he shouted out, finished, meaning perfect, complete, done, done perfectly. So get this, he had perfectly finished his course and set the stage, important you get this, set the stage for our own perfection being possible by his perfect work to the very end. So perfect doesn't always just have to mean flawless, it can mean, and does mean in the Greek, completed, matured, finished. So point one, no human has other than Christ, has been spiritually perfect, or nor can be, really, while we're in the flesh. Point number two, Yeshua and God are perfect without flaw. We'll see that when it comes to the description of God himself. Yes, he is absolutely flawless, perfect. But when it, turns, when, we, when it comes to human beings, there's no way any of us other than Christ have been perfect and mature. Christ was not born with a stain of sin, he was born to the seed of heavenly perfect father. So there are some things about Christ. Though he was made like a human, looked like a human, was a human. The seed that impregnated him came from the father, not from the seed of Adam, and Adam's descendants. Yeah, Philippians 3 verse 15, that all of us who are perfect have this mind. In the King James, a lot of times when you read in the New Testament the word perfect, You'll see in other translations, they correctly, uh, you, can, you can translate it perfect. You can translate it also, as many others do, uh, mature. As many of us who are mature, as many of us who are grown up, as many of us are who are complete. Ephesians 4, verses 12 to 13, uh, talking about the ministry and all that, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, so we all become to the, all come to the unity of the faith. Ephesians 4, verse 13. And the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Most translations say mature or full grown or complete. To a mature man, to a complete man, to a fully grown man. So I'm just saying the word perfect, as you read it many times in the King James and New King James, often uh, better in context and understanding it could be translated mature, perfected that way. Uh, Ephesians 4.13, the same verse in the Berean study Bible says, until we reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the Son of God, as we mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ, as we mature. 
or as we become complete to the full measure. So keep in mind that in the Greek, perfect means reached its end goal, matured. Now going on to a third point. When God covers us with his righteousness and his grace, he sees each of us, believe it or not, as he sees Jesus Christ, Yeshua, beings who will be spiritually perfect in his eyes and in a sense already that way in his eyes. Remember, I ask if we're ever to be perfect, will it have to be an act of God? You shall therefore be perfect. You shall be perfect. That's going to be an act of God, as perfect as your Father is in heaven. This perfection is something God has and God does in us. It's God's finishing school. It's his finishing touches. God, in the end, covers us not only with his righteousness and his grace and his love, but he covers us with his perfection, his perfect completeness. This is not a time to be thinking in terms of do-it-yourself righteousness. This is not a time for do-it-yourself. You guys might like to paint your own room or dig your own garden and all that and not pay someone else to do it. But when it comes to a clean heart, David said correctly, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore a right spirit within me. You do it, God. I can't create my own clean heart. You are the creator, including of my new self, the new creation. You are whom I look for, for that perfection. But how do we come complete and perfected? Who does it? I kind of said it already, but let's read some verses. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Him, Christ, we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect, mature, complete, perfect. How? In Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily, that we may present every man, Colossians 1, 28, 29, Perfect in Christ Jesus. I have a series of sermons about what it means to be in Christ, in God. Uh, you might want to just, uh, you might just want to put that in the search bar. In Christ, see what pops up. It's very important you understand what it means to be in Christ. By completing his task perfectly, his perfect assignment completely, he could ex- exclaim at the cross, "Perfect, finished." And that perfect life is given for you and me and will also perfect us. That's why it's called the righteousness, which is by faith. You say, yeah, but I'm not perfect yet. Well, you have to understand that God sees the end from the beginning. He declares the end from the beginning. That's why he was able to say, Yeshua was able to say, you don't believe in a resurrection and and life then why is it said that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Because he's looking ahead to that resurrection. In Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 10. Isaiah 46, 9 to 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there's no other. I am God, there's none like me. Isaiah 46, 10 is where I'm going. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. I'm declaring the end. So from that point of view, God, knowing what he's doing in you and in me, and in all the forefathers and foremothers ahead of us, the Abrams and Sarahs, the, the Ruth and, and uh, uh, the, the Ruth, the Esthers, all the different great men and women as well, Isaac, Jacob, Peter, David, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus. So many great men and women in the Bible. Look what it says now in Hebrews 10, 14. From the point of view of seeing the end from the beginning, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever, has perfected forever 
those who are being set apart as holy, being sanctified. For by one offering he has perfected forever. Hebrews 10, 14, a verse you need to know. So many Church of God brethren struggle with this verse. Struggle no longer. God sees how you end up from the beginning to the very end. He sees how you end up. He has perfected you in Christ as far as he is concerned. The only one who can absolutely ruin this is you yourself, if you in rebellion totally turn your back on him. But I'm going to show you some verses where he's not done with you yet. Be patient. God's not finished. <laughs> God's not finished with me yet, as that little statue that I bought says. I looked up about 24 translations. All but two of them says he has perfected or made perfect. First Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body, every bit of you, be preserved blameless. When? At the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When will you be preserved blameless? At the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. Now look at these last few words. Who also will do it. Preserve you blameless. He who calls you is faithful. Who will also do it. Who's going to make you blameless? You? Oh, we depart from sin. We turn. We repent. We turn to God. We repent every time we fail. But the one who's going to get us there all the way is Yeshua. The English Standard Version says, He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Christ, now look at Philippians 1 6. He's going to complete what he started. God called you. God the Father himself called you. Out of billions of people on the earth, he chose you to be called at this time. He handed you over to Yeshua to work with and to reveal the Father through Christ. He started something. The goodness of God brought you to repentance, Romans 2 4 says. Now, Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this thing, this very thing, that he, that's God, who has begun a good thing in you, will complete it. Until that, when? And when will it, will it be finished? When will it be perfect? When will it be completed? When will it be perfected? He who begun a good work in you will, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. There you go again. He's the author and finisher of our faith. That's how we're going to be made perfect. Are you getting it? Are you seeing it? You all know John 10.10. 10. Jesus said that he came that he might have life and, and that, we might have it more, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We focus on the part that says abundantly and abundant life and miss the point and the fact that he came that we might have life. We didn't even have life until he came. We were dead in our sins. We were dead in trespasses. Ephesians 2 verse 5 says, We were dead in trespasses who made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. All of that in Ephesians. So who brings you to perfection? Is it you? Is it me? Again, Hebrews 10, 14, we read earlier, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He is the one who will clothe you with his righteousness. He is the one. Remember the story of the prodigal son? One of the first things the father said was, bring out the best robe. Bring out the best robe. The best robe is symbolic of God's righteousness that covers us. Take off the filthy garments, like he said to Zechariah, in, in the book of Zechariah about the Joshua the high priest. Take off his filthy garments, for he was like a brand pulled out of the fire. The high priest had filthy garments. Take them off. Put on clean garments. So Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in Jehovah. My soul shall be joyful in God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. 
we do the works of we do the righteous acts of the saints. But remember, even in Revelation 19, at the at the wedding ceremony up in heaven, it says very clearly that to the bride was granted beautiful white garments, and these are the righteous acts of the saints. But it was granted to her to be covered by something God gives her. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. So we receive this righteousness by faith in him. We do have to take this calling and this opportunity very, very seriously. We do have to be like the prodigal son who turns back to our father. We do have to be, Romans 8.13 says, those who live a way of life according to the flesh will die. But if we live by the Spirit and put to death the deeds of the flesh, we'll live. We do have to turn around. We do have to strive against sin, though we do so imperfectly too many times. We do have to strive. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, I'll put the whole text in the notes. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Such were, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, set apart for holy use, and you were justified, declared righteous in God's eyes, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Boy, oh boy, are you seeing it? First John 3, 9 says that once we have been born or begotten even into the very family of God, we're supposed to walk away from the way of sin. We no longer want to sin. We just can't. We just can't go that way as a way of life anymore. Some people like to quote Philippians 2, 12. And what about Philippians 2, 12, where it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Uh-huh, Philip, how about that? Work out your own salvation. Are you saying I'm my own savior? No, I'm not my own savior. The problem with people who quote Philippians 2.12 is they don't read the next verse. So let's read it. Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then they stop reading. I'm going to keep reading. For it is God. For it is God who works in you. He says, work out your own salvation. He's saying, get in tune with God. He's the one working out your own salvation with you. He's the one who will complete what he started in you. He's the one who has perfected you. It is God who works in you both to will, that's your desire, what you want to do, and to do, your ability to do it for his good pleasure. So clear. You're not your own savior. You're not your own creator of the new clean heart. You're not your own creator of the new creation. There's one creator. That's God. And the physical will still fail too often, like Paul says in Romans 7. But those in the flesh, living by their carnal mind, cannot please God. Romans 8, verse 7 and 8. Are you in the flesh? Too many of you still say yes. Because look, I believe, prick my... Skin, you'll see it bleeds. I'm fleshly. But you are not in the flesh by the terms of that phrase. Those in the flesh, it says, hate God. Do you hate God? I don't hate God. Cannot please God. Can you not please God? Many verses talk about how you can please God. I think I even have a sermon on pleasing God. So are you in the flesh? Paul answers that question, Romans 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So you see, we now have these two natures inside of us, the old man, the old self, and now we have the new creation. We have the new heart from God. I don't, I still have the Jeremiah 17, 9 heart that's deceitful and desperately wicked. That's part of my carnal old self. It's dead. But the new life in Christ and the new heart from God That is not a hateful, deceitful, and wicked heart. That's a heart God gave me. It's a good heart. It's a clean heart from God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, the psalmist said. 
that new heart from God loves God, doesn't hate God. So these are I'm just tossing these things up because people use them as counterpoints to say I'm wrong, that uh, that somehow God will give us this perfection. Anyway, so we all still act like we're in the flesh sometimes. We all still have flesh. We all still have sins. But those are acts of the old self, not the new self. That's why Paul was Paul said something very dramatic in Romans 7. He says, therefore, when I sin, that's not, no longer me. That's no longer I doing it, but sin, the old man that dwells in me. It's now sin that dwells in me that sins. So differentiate now between being in the flesh and being in the spirit. We have those two natures. The other thing people get mixed up on is, is uh, reward and salvation. I don't have time to go into this in depth, but let me just say to you, we're always mixing those up, okay? You know, often mix up salvation by grace with reward, which is based on our works. Salvation is eternal life based on what God does, his grace, not our works. Reward is based on what we do. We shall be rewarded by our works. But that's not eternal salvation. Don't mix the two up. Our works determine what we'll be doing for all eternity, what position we'll have in the kingdom, but does not determine eternal life. Salvation is God's gift. You can't work it. You have faith in it. You ask for it. You accept it. But it's not something earned. So we've got to quit mixing up works and grace. Now, when does this salvation perfection happen? Are you perfect now? The answer technically is yes and no. Yes, in that we are in the perfect body of Christ right now, and there's no part of his body that's imperfect. There's no part of his body that's unclean. If you're in Christ, that's the new you. That's the new person. He is our covering of righteousness. The Bible clearly describes our perfection, something like that, in God's eyes, who sees the end from the beginning as something that has already happened as far as he's concerned. Now, Hebrews 10, verses 12 to 14. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies be made his footstool, now we're in verse 14 of Hebrews 10, verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So who does it? It's definitely Christ doing it. So we are spiritually perfect right now, then. I mean, are we spiritually perfect right now in reality? Are we flawless? No, Paul said that not that I've already attained. I'm not already perfect. We read that earlier, Philippians 3, 14. But how about those who are in Christ, who have died? All the big names in Hebrews 11. Everybody from Samson to the apostles and prophets later on, you know. But in Hebrews 11, we have Enoch, and we have Noah, and we have Abraham. We have the prophets. How about them? Were they perfected? In the literal, final, finished sense? When will their perfection come? When will ours come? Hebrews 11, verses 39 to 40. I'm reading from the NIV. It says here in the NIV, Hebrews 11, 40, those, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they'd been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Talking about the Hebrews 11, uh, heroes of faith. Only together with us would they be made perfect. What's that telling you? What's that telling you? All of God's children will attain that perfect perfection, that flawless completion, the finished product, together at the same time. I guess technically those who have died in Christ will be perfected moments sooner I'm talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Paul, Peter, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Noah, Ruth, James, Mary Magdalene, together with you, together with me, all at the same time, at the sound of that seventh trumpet, I think so exciting. Let's read it again. Only together with us 
would they be made perfect. This is saying we're all going to be made perfect, as perfect as God is perfect, at the resurrection, at the same time as all the icons of Scripture. Noah, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Peter, Paul, all of them. It's God's gift. When will this perfection happen? At the last trump of God, as Christ descends in mighty majesty and power to receive his elect, his bride, when our fleshly, corruptible self puts on incorruption, when our weak flesh puts on strong, unassailable spirit, after speaking of the men and women of faith, Hebrews 11 says that, that none of them received the promises yet, but will be perfected alongside with us. Philippians 1, 6, remember, says he is faithful to complete that which he has begun in us until when? Till the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6. Jude 24 and 25. Now to him, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. Now Jude is saying this to a bunch of people whom he's correcting a bit earlier in the, in, in, in the book of being a little too easygoing with accepting uh, licentiousness. Don't you be like those people that are doing that, he says. But now he ends by saying, to him who's able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore, and as we're changed to spirit and our corruptible puts on incorruption, as our flesh puts on spirit, as our imperfection puts on perfection, finally, maybe all of us could say with Christ, it is finished. Finally, completed. It's done. Perfect. Jesus presents his bride to himself, remember, without spot or wrinkle, it says in Ephesians 5. He's the one with the spot remover. He's the one with the iron to iron out the wrinkles in our lives. That's the way he will see and does see his wife. He sees the end from the beginning, without spot, no wrinkle, no blemish. Perfect. What a team God's creating. Each one of us will bring something to the table. It's not going to be just Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or David or the prophets. But you'll be there too, and you'll be bringing. You'll be bringing everything that you. That was used to mature and perfect you to the table as well. You have a seat at the table of God as well. I find this very moving because I've been so imperfect in my life. Thanks be to God. Who's been so gracious to me, and to you. He wants you there, perfect, spotless you. And that will be the way it is when it's all said and done. And yes, you will have your part in that kingdom to make it all fit and work together flawlessly. And we'll all sing the new song of Moses in Revelation 15 in perfect harmony, whether you can sing now or not. doesn't matter. At that time, you will. Perfect harmony, perfect pitch, perfect tone, perfect blend. Because you will be perfect. Look what Paul said about that. As we read him, keep in mind that God has a dream for you. God has a goal, something he wants you to attain. We're the only ones who can stop that. If we turn violently, rebelliously away from him. But Paul says, I don't want my own righteousness, my own perfection. I don't want that. Philippians 3, 9. I want to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness, the perfection, if you will, which is from God by faith. Again, our faith has to be in him. And God's credited righteousness to us is imputed righteousness. So as a result, we will see, be able to see God, perfect God. I mean, God the Father. For we shall be just like him. 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. 
Behold, one of my favorite verses. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we do know this, that when, we, when he, when God is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. No flesh and blood person can see God and live. Not, not in his glory. You can't. But we shall be like him and see him as he is. Remember what we started with. You shall therefore be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. It is an act of God. It is a gift. Because of our father's grace and Yeshua's perfect sacrifice and life, we will indeed at the last, last trump be flawlessly perfect and be able to exclaim, Finished! Perfect! To the glory of Jesus Christ and God the Father. We shall be just like Father when we meet him. A certain king put on a wedding for his son. Remember Matthew 22, verse 1. The king is God the Father. The son is Yeshua. And the king is there. Revelation 19, we go to heaven to be married. I'm sure we meet the Father. Matthew 5, 48, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, just like him. I'm looking forward to this reunion of all of God's children being made perfect, every single one, together, together, perfect, complete, flawless, blameless, Godspeed, that wonderful day. <laughs>